you are an entrepreneur, a professional, a speaker, or a coach, and although you've come a long way, it's time for you to take it to the next level. We've got you. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. We'll help you use authority and influencer marketing to build your business stronger and faster by publishing a book. You'll hear from guests that are thought leaders in sales, marketing, networking, communication, social media, promotion, and business leadership. Let's do it. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. And now your host, the extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder. Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today, I want to encourage you to look at your buyers, understand the journey that they take so that you can sell to them more effectively. I'd like to welcome Nate Morse to the show. Morse to the show. And Nate, I'm going to ask you a question right off the bat. Does the buyer's journey make a difference? Buyer's journey totally makes a difference. <laughs> Give me a little more there, Nate. So they have to go down. Do you want me to go right into it with the books and where, where books play a role in it? And Just give us a quick overview. Yeah. So the buyer's journey, right? Like you have the step of them being aware that they like have a problem all the way until there's them buying it from you. And along the way, there's there's two things. There's really like, what are the actions that your buyer has to take? And then what do they need to learn along the way? And so they have to solve those before they can actually buy from you. And so if you don't have a resource or something like that, that can actually help them through the journey, someone else is going to help them because the person that actually helps them make the decision usually ends up being the one that they work with because they were helping them. Yep. That was what I was looking so for. So instead of just being a brochure, <laughs> like help the people who have the problem beyond just when they have money. But well, a book <laughs> is fine. A book works, but you know. So Nate, why don't you take a minute or two, introduce yourself and let us know how you got into this. Totally. So my name is Nate Morse. I'm the founder of Apex Conversion. And that started as about three years ago when basically when COVID hit and I was working online. But before that, really where I figured it out is I had made this transition from working in automotive sales, so person-to-person -person sales, then went to online in RV sales, and really seeing like how the buyer's journey is online versus in person. Because online, everybody's basically just putting up their information, but they're not helping people through the buyer's journey like it is if you like go into store, you know, mm -hmm. work with someone individually. And so like recognizing that huge gap, that's where I kind of went, okay, let's find where are the people that our ideal client and they're underserved by the market and then let's go out and help them. And so it's happened in, in various different industries. We've actually, I've had other companies that have worked with like automotive, real estate, RV, and then now with, with LinkedIn being the main focus for the last three years, we're helping online businesses find their ideal client and utilize really those areas in the buyer's journey to create those relationships. Nice, nice. So let, let's explore the, your story a little bit there, Nate. So, you know, during this process, were there times that you found it really hard? Because, you know, we all as entrepreneurs have these these times where it's like, I can't believe I got myself into this moments. Yeah, yeah. Specifically, we want to go into tough ones about the book <laughs> and the creation of that. Okay, so first of all, before you do that, let's just want to jump in book and then we'll share a bit of your journey there. Totally. So the LinkedIn high ticket handbook, this came out in early of 2021 before chat GPT was around. There was actually one called Jasper and there was a group of people in there. And one guy was like, Hey, let's see if we can, if we can write a book within a week. And so we we're all like, yeah, let's, let's put the pressure on ourselves. Let's see how that happens or how we can do that. And so I spent the majority of the week making a book that did not end up being this one. So I think that and anybody making a book can probably say like, yeah, this is my fourth book. Like it's the first one I've published, but there were three books that were not all the way there that were that were like that. So that would be, yeah, going back into the challenge, that would be a challenge uh, 
in that. But anyways, so yeah, this book is made to help people that are looking to maybe they're on LinkedIn because they had a job in the past, but now they're looking to get more out of it. This is like hacks of how to make it so that your profile shows up in more searches, examples of how to reach out to people so that you can get clients by using relevancy to drive urgency and not spamming on LinkedIn. So yeah, that's the, that's what it's for. So what was the hardest part in that journey of, of writing and publishing the book? Yeah. So the hardest part in the journey I would say is going slow and not trying to like, especially now, I think people's biggest challenge now is kind of like the, in the matrix, there's the woman in the red dress. And I think the woman in the red dress for people right now is wanting to just go to AI and just be like, Hey, write this whole book and then write the whole thing so that they can check off it being written. I think, so I think that it's, yeah, I think it's the, I think it's the opportunities that make it so that you could make like a lower quality book. But, you know, a lot of the challenge too is just getting, is just sitting down and getting the ideas. And instead of, you know, waiting for inspiration, just sitting down and having their inspiration come to you after you've been sitting down. So I, I think it's kind of a you against yourself is the hardest part. And you, you know, making this resource that, you know, you got lots of urgent stuff that's important that you probably got to do every day, you know? And so how do you, how do you set that time? If you feel like you're already behind to create something like a book that, you know, isn't necessarily urgent right now, but it can make a big impact on your business. I think it's like a personal battle of that. Yeah. You know what, Nate, it's true. Like I've worked with over 200 people to help them become authors. And the biggest battles in the journey to become an author is, in the three pounds of gray matter that sits between your ears and in, and in your heart, because there's you, your book is a piece of you. It's a bit of who you are. And, and for many of my clients, I've said to them, I said, at the end of the process, I said, you felt like you just squeezed out a baby, didn't you? And they're like, yes, nine months to a year. And this kid is finally born and I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm like, well, not always exhausted, but they're like, yeah, I was it's exhausted. like having this kid. Mentally, I was like, I have no more ideas. All my ideas are gone. I used, I used <laughs> them all up. You'd go to the idea store and get some, you know. It was funny. I was talking to one of my clients the other day, and we were, we were talking about this. And I said, um, you know, because they, they had talked about one of their previous experiences before working with us and and how somebody they had written some stuff and then they put it out to like a mastermind group they were in and everyone just tore it apart. And I said, it's like you present your newborn baby and everybody tells you it's ugly. That is a hard part. <laughs> yeah. Cause you're like, I put in all this work and this is like the manifesto and then you give it to them and they're like, this is crap. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go be depressed for a few days <laughs> and then, and then, and then like revisit it. Cause I just can't revisit it at this point yeah so we're going to come back to your book a little bit later in the episode but i want to switch gears here and uh, just before we do that audience we're going to take a very quick ad break but i want to encourage you to listen to the ad i have been developing a ton of free resources for you that are going to help you on your journey to not only create your book but use it to scale your business We'll be right back. One of the keys to becoming an author is hiring the right publisher. It's the difference between having a book that converts readers into clients and one that sits unused on a shelf. Check out seven questions to ask before hiring a publisher. Get it free at authortoauthority.com slash publisher. Welcome back, Nate. We were just talking a little bit about your book there, and we will get back to that. But I want to switch over to the to understanding the buyer's journey. So I know you've come prepared with some some hints, some tips, some teachings, some training on it. So I'm going to let you loose to share what you've prepared today for us. Totally. And yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love for this uh love for you to hop in and uh and ask me some questions if there's anything that's that's intriguing. Um uh, I think that the like one of the most important aspects of having a book and kind of a reason that I made it is from there's a quote that Seth Godin has, and it's basically like, people like us think like this. And so, you know, as you want to become the authority in your niche, what do people that are the authority, like, what do they have, right? Like, what's a viewpoint of an expert? And a lot of people, 
that is like, okay, if they've made a book, right, they're an expert in it. And so just understanding your, your customers and like, what's their worldview and how do they go in it? And so like along that buyer's journey, if they're going to be looking for resources and things, and you can show your expertise by creating a book, that's a, like a resource that has a lot of leverage. Just like you were saying earlier, you go through all of this work to make a baby. Well, each time that you have to explain and help someone see the world in the way that you're trying to give, you're doing that over and over and over again. So, you know, you might be constantly having babies at that rate in terms of effort, <laughs> right? Or you can just make one baby that instantly is, is pops out at adulthood in terms of like maintenance <laughs> right and they're and they're doing their they're doing their job you know they're actually going in and doing some of the leverage for you and making even just the the perceived you know value of what you're doing and it's not you know some people might be listening to this and thinking that okay well that might be uh, you know that sounds like manipulation right but if you're creating a book that has true value and you know that that's the way that they think you're actually fitting into their world and making things easier for them right mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with with your intention. But yeah, I think that as someone's going through that buyer's journey and you're looking at those stages of, yeah, what do they need to learn? What actions do they need to take? Like, what's the best resource that they're going to want the most that's actually the most helpful for them? So maybe you have your book, but maybe there's like an accompanying, you know, course or something like that mm -hmm. that makes so that they can connect with you and engage further, you know, in the buyer's journey, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So there's... It just opens the door to a ton of possibilities that you can have in there and kind of go through in that, in that buyer's journey. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's like the most important piece <laughs> in my head. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of creating it. Yeah. I mean, just like figuring out the whole outline, I had done different variations too. Like before this, there was a book that on the way, cause I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And so on the way there and back, I was calling someone and then they would ask me questions and they would take it down. And I thought that was a cool way for me to get further without having to sit down and write because writing, I'd rather do this all day. I'd rather talk than, than be writing personally. I do still like to write. I make a lot of content, but it's so much faster. It's so much faster and there's like personality and stuff in it. Then you could turn it. Maybe there's an audiobook, you know, potential at the end of that. <laughs> but yeah, I did. That was the first, that was the first approach. And that took like three years. Didn't took like forever on the editing side. Once that original content was in there and then, yeah, then and tried this, made this specifically around LinkedIn. And it became a Amazon bestseller on like four different lists within a couple mm -hmm. days. So I didn't expect that. That was really cool. But yeah, now it's now it's one of the biggest resources. And I believe now I'm we're working on, I was just talking to my team this morning on creating the next version of it uh, or a different book. So that's kind of an interesting thing too, is do you update the current book as that main piece or do you create an additional book? I even like your, your opinion on that. I wonder if other people in the audience are... I want that once they've made their first book or if they've made their first one and now they're, or if they haven't and they're considering kind of that path. Well, so audience, you're getting a preview of what is going to be released and let's do a little bit of a book audit here. So let me ask you a few questions. So yeah. that will, that will tell you whether you're going to write the new book or whether you're going to revise the old book. Do it. Roast me in public. Let's go. Okay. So when we look at creating a book that converts readers into clients, there's six aspects. So let's go through each one. The first one is C. So it's on the word based on the word create. So in your opinion, people who have read it, had, does it create an authentic relationship with them? Yes. Prove it. I'd have to show you people's responses from reading it and where they engaged with us after that and went into our group and things like that. So basically, it sounds like did they, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that you want the book to actually, you want a way to know that people are not only reading the book, but actually taking next steps with you. Well, mostly it's the feedback from the book. So, you know, if you've gotten feedback like, Nate, like I, after reading your book, I know, like, trust you, like, I feel like I know you, like your story touched me. Like when you get responses like that to your book, then you know you've created an authentic relationship with it with them. If they feel like they really know you after the book, that's usually an indication that you've created that good relationship through the book. Yeah. I mean, I made this, you know, a couple of years ago and I feel like now there's more potential in the next version of it. <laughs> yeah. 
So in the book, did you share about yourself in the book or was it more like a technical book? Um, I There are technical aspects, but it was mostly storytelling in terms of showing them how, because I think that they understand better mm-hmm. when it's in you know story mode people don't like lectures they like but they pay to go to the movie yeah. i mean they pay for lectures too but okay so the r is reveals the real problem so in your book did you do a deep dive into the problem they're facing yeah absolutely i really think that a, a lot of the reasons that people haven't started working with you or haven't engaged with your content or anything yet is because they don't view the problem in the right way so i think that the book is like a fantastic thing Because it's long form, you know, if you're creating a short post on social media, it has to be super digestible, but you can have short pieces of content. You know, I'll recommend this to people on LinkedIn, short pieces of content that lead them into going to, you know, get your book, something like that into those deeper pieces where you can actually be a thought leader and show them, you know, the perspective that is in their best interest. Okay. So does your book engage the reader? So there's two aspects to this. So first of all, have you received feedback that the the flow of the book is good, like it's the readability is good, those types of things? Yeah. Before I launched it, I, I sent it to a ton of people in groups to make sure that that was, that was the case. Perfect. Okay. The second thing, do you have call to actions in your book? Yeah. Throughout it. Throughout it. Yay! I am what they need. Yes. Okay. There's a lot of so- people that... Not even in just the book world, but I see a lot of people that they make content, but then they're not giving like a call to action. And they're like, oh, why aren't I growing? And it's like, because (laughs) you're not, they're not doing anything. (laughs) Okay. So I suspect the answer to this question is yes, but the next one is answers their questions. So do you give them the what and the why and enough how to get them started? Yes. Yay. Okay. Arrange the what in a way that shows the how. I like it. I like it. Now, is the book targeted to a specific person or niche? Yes. And if if you're listening on the audio, I just had my thumbs up there. That is one of the hugest problems we see in books is that they're not targeted. So, so they're, not relevant. they're not or they're not really like super relevant to a specific one, so it makes it kind of generic. Well, they write the book to everyone. Yeah. And then it's made for no one. You got it. All right, the E, excellently done. So has it been professionally edited, formatted? Did you have the covers done by a professional? Is everything done excellently in your book? Yes, however, my standards go high. Like after you make it, right? You're like, ah, now I know, now I know what to do, you know? So I would say yes, but there's, you know, there's always room for, always room for growth. But in terms of the actual steps of, yeah, like I had technical editors look at it and then I have a sister branding agency that actually went and designed all the, all the graphics and everything. Perfect. Okay. So uh, hold up the book again. Cause it's how many words would you say that is, or how many pages is it? I think we would classify this as like a mini, like a mini book. So there's like okay. 50 pages in it. All right. So. My suggestion to you is, is that you need to write book number two. I was literally just talking to someone about this. So, yes. <laughs> now, the reason being, okay, that first book clicked all the chat marks, except for one that's not normally would be normally part of the list of ones I do. Because normally when I talk to people, just getting through those six and making sure those first six things are done well is difficult. But in your case, if you really want to be seen as the thought leader, you've got to create a longer book. A 50, a 50 page book does not, it's not that you're not an author or anything else, but if you want to be seen as that true thought leader, you the perception, okay, only perception, but you have to go with the perception. Totally. Got to fit into their world. If you're a true thought leader, then you can write at least a hundred to a 200 page book. Because you've got that much to share. Yeah. Now, let's say that someone else goes and they go, okay, what's the MVP of the book? So they create that initial book. Do you always recommend them creating a a second book that's longer? Would you ever recommend them making a second version of the book that's longer? Well, like I think in your case, you'd have to look at how much more that you feel that you can add or... Is the book now old enough that, and you've grown enough that when you go back and read the book, you're thinking, I've grown so much 
since then I really need to start over. Or you can look at the book and go, you know what? It's still really relevant. It's still really good. I can expand on it. And so you do a new addition to the book. Now, here's the thing with doing new editions. If you've changed more than 10% of the book, you have to upload the book as a new book and you lose all your Amazon reviews. Okay, that's a new book. Yeah, it's a new book completely. <laughs> that that's is the, uh, that's the answer right there, really. That is, uh, that's all I needed. That's all I needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you can only change so much before. Now, here's the thing. Technically, you could just upload a bigger book. And there's a possibility that Amazon might not notice it. But if they do, first of all, they'll take down your book. And second, there's a likelihood that they're going to go, okay, well, you can't publish for a while. Or third, if you really break the rules, they go, we just, you just can't publish books at all anymore. So yeah. in my opinion, you're always better off to go by their rules and regulations and don't try to game the system or cheat the system by doing something that's against the rules. Cause eventually you do get caught. It's just yeah. a matter of when. And that, that actually makes sense. Cause I mean, on the, on the other side of it, like we're talking about with that buyer's journey before, right? If you were to map out, you know, here's where they're, where they first become aware of the issue of the problem, not the solution, but the problem all the way until they're buying from you in the middle, there's more than one step. Right. So, yeah. you know, there might be like 10, 20 steps. And so you could theoretically have a resource or a book for each step. Right. So mm -hmm. if someone's listening to this and they're mapping it out, you know, what are the actions they have to take? What are the things that they have to learn? You're probably going to recognize a spot where you're like, okay, that's the first book. Here's the second book. Like, here's the third book, you know, and then you can, you know, have a yeah. series that goes throughout it and make it so that you're, you know, you're, you're being the guide, making them the hero of their own journey. And you're doing it through the resources instead of constantly having to, to tell them or create content consistently. There's a ton of leverage in it. You should always have one book that's your signature book, that it's the main book that you're known for. And then you do other books around it that go do deeper dives into specific talk, topics. But I do, we start talking about the buyer's journey again. So I want to dive into that a little bit more there, Nate, because we haven't really gotten deep into the buyer's journey. So you talked about the steps between the person becoming aware that they're a problem and buying the product and service. Can you talk about some of those steps so that we can have a better understanding? Totally. And since this is a book podcast, there is a book called Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz that is basically the Bible of marketing, like almost like the first book of, of that. And um, that's really where they go over it. So you have, you have problem aware, right? You have problem aware, and then you have solution aware, right? So they have to really understand like what's going on first and viewing the problem in the right way before, if you sell something, before they can actually view that as the right solution. So they, they can't become solution aware and want to buy without, being really problem aware. Mm -hmm. And so that's where things like this, you know, you can use the the story, you know, you can use different things. Like you were asking me if they talk about the problem in that like kind of checklist, that would be something in there that would really help them go through there. And for example, we could use, you know, on LinkedIn, a big part of it for me that I was writing in here is that the, they weren't really problem aware in terms of LinkedIn has a lot of the clients that they can have and that a lot of people view it as something that is, you know, more for hiring still. And so if they're just viewing LinkedIn for hiring, cause that's when they put everything on there. My goal in the book is how do I make them see the potential of it? Because if they don't see the potential of it, they don't understand the problem correctly. Then it doesn't matter what I say about the solution because they're not even at that stage yet, you know? Yeah. yeah. And what really first came from me even like diving into this was actually when I went into, I talked about that switch earlier where I went from the automotive into the RV world is when I was in the RV world, I actually looked up like Google came out with a study and it was, and it basically said like, here are all the steps that someone has to go through before buying a car before they can actually buy. So they have to know like, is this the one, the right one for me? Like, am I getting the best deal? So there's all these internal questions that they have to answer before they can do it. And that's still even more on the, on the, you know, solution side. That's not even them like viewing the problem correctly. You know? Well, usually there's there's two situations when you're buying a car. Either you want to buy a car or you need 
to buy a car. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think I think each one of those journeys is a little bit different. You know, if you're like my husband and I who buy used cars, you hit the point where you need to buy a car. And so the decision making process becomes a whole lot faster because you can't go without a vehicle. And then there's the people who want to buy a car who can take their time and browse around it. <laughs> yeah. But like you gave a pretty critical aspect in there. And that's that you've been through the buyer's journey multiple times. For the people that are listening, how many times have they been through your buyer's journey is going to show like kind of how fast they can go through it and also their their risk. Like you probably feel way safer now and because you feel like you have control of the buying process versus them. They don't have control. They, they're kind of like, there's a lot more risk in there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, Nate, we are... We are coming close to the end of the time. This has been an unusual one. We've kind of switched back and forth, but I, I didn't ask you the question that I've asked every single author who comes on the show. And so the audience, this is the question the audience always knows to anticipate. So I will ask it to you in the first and the last, sorry, last few moments of the show. What was the good, the bad, and the ugly of writing and publishing that book? Okay. The good's the easiest. So you get more clients, you get more money. There is sales are easier because you're like giving them more help. The bad is that it's a challenge internally. And so everything that you, how you thought it was going to go, it's probably not going to be it. So you're going to have to like restructure your life and take a step back and, and uh, not be, uh, you know, discouraged that that draft wasn't wasn't perfect. So I think, yeah, a lot of the battle is is internal. And actually, back going back to the good, I think that we live in an age where you know, you and I can just you know write make a Google document, you know, over a month or whatever, and then you know throw that into Amazon. So in in terms of like the KDP route, so in terms of that, like publishing is very easy in the day and age. You know, I think that's potentially the best of the good in my, in my opinion, it's just the day that an age that we live in that we're able to do that just so, so easy. And the ugly would be the book in the middle, <laughs> the book in the middle before it was perfect. And the actual process of once you have the book, people don't always, you know, they're not just going to automatically start, start buying it. No, you got to You got to tell people. So, you know, once you have the book now, there's a whole nother job that you start now. Now you got to start marketing it, you know, in whatever way uh, that you do that. And if you've never marketed a book before, you know, that usually the first time you do anything, it's going to be ugly. You know, you look at nature, like growth is ugly for the most part and like the in-between growth phases, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're making the book and it's your first book and then it's your first time marketing a book, like that whole thing is going to be growth and it's going to be ugly. And, and the bad is, is your perception getting in the way and kind of like, you know, halting you. Um, yeah. And I think the good is just actually how easy it is in this day and age. If I could resummarize it. Yeah. Nice. 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 Thank you so much, Nate. I've got one minute for you to give a closing thought and to share how people can connect with you if they've enjoyed today's episode. Absolutely. All right. So yeah, closing thought is to really just think about your buyers out there. Don't just be there for when they're, you know, don't just be a brochure and be there for when they're actually able to buy, create resources like books and things that help people that may not buy from you for a year. But if you're going to be in business for longer than a year, you can have way more customers if you're actually focusing on helping the market, even if they're not buying today. And I think that a lot of people don't do that. So I think that that's an easy way to enjoy your business more and to enjoy being an author more and to make more of an impact. In terms of finding me, you can either find me on social media, Nate Morse, pretty much everywhere. You can get my book at keys.natemorse.com slash book, or you can find it on Amazon. And then if there's put other books and resources on my website at natemorse.com slash gift. And if people are listening, it's Morse, M-O-R-S-E, like Morse code, not M-O-R-I-S. <laughs> That sometimes people think so we'll put that we'll put that in there but yeah thanks for having me on here kim you're so welcome nate and if you're watching on youtube click the thumbnail that's either to the top or to the left or to the right we are still figuring that one out it's gonna be and there somewhere. It's, episode, 
It's episode 435, How to Improve Lead Quality and Closing Rates by 87%. So after today's conversation and you've learned about the buyer's journey, what are some of the next steps that you can take to increase the quality of the people who are entering the buyer's journey and then the closing rate on top of that? If you're on your podcast app, you can sp- sp- scan. Okay, it's one of those days. Scan back to episode 435. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And we will see you on the very next episode. Bye now. You've been been listening to the the Author to Authority Authority Podcast. Podcast. The extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder, has helped over 200 entrepreneurs, professionals, speakers, and coaches write and publish their books that have become incredible marketing tools for their business. And many of those have gone on to become Amazon best-selling authors and have used their books to land high-level clients and get on big stages. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at www.author2authoritypodcast.com. See you next time. 